Hi guys, Todd here and welcome back to SDRTK. Hope you're having a great week. Today I'm going to take a look at the Warm Audio WA47 Junior. This is a FET condenser microphone, can be found in studios around the world. Gets used for recording everything from dialogue to vocals, acoustic instruments, amp cabinets, drums, and just about anything else you can think of. And it's highly regarded as being a very natural and low noise microphone. So let's check it out. Let's see if it's the right microphone for you. And as always, all the audio tests and comparisons in this review are going to be done without processing, unless I tell you I'm doing a processed audio demonstration. So I recommend you put on a good set of headphones so you get the best experience. Now, I've hadn't been working with this microphone for some time, but in this review, I will go ahead and roll back the clock. I'll unbox the microphone for you. I'll briefly go through a few of the specs. Then we're going to get into the unprocessed audio tests. And we'll be using the Focusrite Scarlett 8i6, also the ART Voice Channel preamp only, and the DBX286S, again, preamp only. So we're going to get an idea of a few different preamps and how they affect the sound of this microphone. After that, I'll get into the comparisons, again, all without processing. We'll check this microphone out compared to some other a large diaphragm condensers, even a few dynamics. After that, I'll go ahead and mic up the guitar and bass amps, and we'll do some recordings. We'll compare them to the original files, as well as the recordings made with the Shure SM57, another staple for that application. Once we get through that, I'll do some processed audio demonstrations. Again, we'll use plugins and hardware. We'll see what we can get out of this microphone. And finally, I'll go ahead and give you my final thoughts. All right, so let's take a look at what we get in the box. It's a nice package, well, uh, you know, well made, really solid. It's going to keep everything uh, safe as it gets to you. So I'll go ahead and uh, and uh, pull this open. Get a little bit of information. Looks like uh, some kind of a, a sticker, and uh, so we'll put that off to the side. Again, the instruction book, pretty nicely put together. A lot of information in there. And uh, then uh, well packed in the foam here. There's uh, a, a pad or a pouch rather to keep the microphone in. Uh, that's uh, nice to have, particularly with uh, you know a microphone like this that you don't want to get damaged probably if you can help it. Then uh, inside we have of course a holder for the mic. It's a nice shock mount. Uh, Warm Audio doesn't skimp on this kind of device. They give you a really good quality shock mount, and uh, you can just feel it from the uh, the weight and the the tension of the uh, of the elastics on it. So. See, uh, you get a couple spares in there as well. So really nice to see that uh, you get what you need. Also, uh, I guess a stand adapter, a couple of stand adapters, so we can use this on uh, 3 8 inch. And uh, then we get the microphone. I'll go ahead and uh, just throw this packaging off to the side. Now the microphone itself is well packaged inside plastic with desiccant. You want that with a condenser mic. I uh, want it to get to you in absolutely pristine condition. Microphone has a pretty good amount of weight to it, feels really solid. You see there's a switch for polar pattern on the front. On the back uh, we've got a high pass filter and uh, there's also a 10 dB pad. So some good switches to have on the mic here. XLR connector on the bottom. Uh, cage feels really solid on this. Overall a well built microphone as you would expect. Now the WA47 Junior is a dual large diaphragm condenser microphone with a single backplate. It uses a 34 millimeter K47 capsule that's modeled after the original 47 mic. The circuitry is fully discrete with Toshiba FETs, WEMA film capacitors, and Panasonic electrolytic capacitors. So everything is 100% as far as the circuitry goes. It gives you a cardioid, figure of eight, and omnidirectional polar patterns, frequency response of 20 to 20,000 hertz. Self noise of only 9 dB, and that's just fantastic, even in the price range this microphone is at. Dynamic range of 138 dB, max SBL of 147 or 157 using the negative 10 dB pad. You get a signal to noise ratio of 85 decibels, so again, really top notch here. Impedance of 100 ohms, and you get controls on the mic for the polar pattern, a high pass filter at 70 Hz, as well as that negative 10 dB pad. Of course, it uses 48 volts phantom power, weighs just under 500 grams or 1.1 pounds. So it's a heavy enough microphone, really well built. And up until this point, you've been listening to me through the microphone connected up directly to the Focusrite Scarlett 8i6. I have the gain set to noon. There's no processing being applied here. Also on the microphone, we're set at a cardioid pickup pattern. I'm also not using the high pass filter or the pad. So this is as neutral and flat as this microphone will be, again, with the cardioid pattern. 
what we'll do is we'll try it out with a couple of other preamps. First of all, I'll move it over to the ART voice channel. That's a tube based preamp. Then we'll go to the DBX286. Again, preamp only, so you can hear what this is like on a DBX preamp. So, first, let's move it over to the ART. And so now I've connected up the WA47 Junior into my ART voice channel. And you can see it behind me here. And although uh, you can see like compression activating and things, what I've done is I've actually routed the preamp audio directly out of the ART using my patch bay so that we can get the sound of the preamp only. It's a tube preamp. We're bypassing all the other internal circuitry, you know, EQ, compression, etc. So preamp only, tube preamp. This is the sound you get. I have the gain set at about 10 o'clock, so it'll give you an idea. 48 volts of phantom power. I'll also mention that I have tested this microphone with 12 volts of phantom power. It doesn't really work out well with that. If you want more details, check out my phantom power video where I actually went through a number of microphones and I compared the frequency response with 48 volts worth as 12 volts. But here, 48 volts on the ART2 preamp. Now we'll uh, swap it over to the DBX286. And again, I'll bypass it so we get mic preamp only. Now I've connected up the 47 Junior into the DBX286S. Again, I've used my patch bay to bypass all of the processing. So I'm coming directly out of the preamp here. So this is the sound you get. I've got the gain set up about noon on the DBX. And so this kind of give you an idea what the tone would be like just in a DBX preamp. Really popular. Uh, a lot of people use them just as individual outboard preamps or, or in a channel strip situation. But I want to give you an idea. Again, uh, DBX preamps, a lot of them in studios. This is what the sound is like through the 47 Junior. Now we'll go ahead with the microphone comparisons. First up, we've got the WA47 Junior against the Audio-Technica AT2020. Right now you're hearing me on the 47 Junior. Of course, it's still connected up to the Scarlet 8i6 with a gain around noon, 48 volts of phantom power and no processing. You've been uh, familiar with the sound already. I just wanted to get you back used to it on the 8i6 before we do the comparison. Now I'm going to switch over and you're hearing me on the AT2020. This is a sound on the Audio-Technica AT2020 through the Scarlet 8i6. Gain again here set at noon, 48 volts phantom power and no processing. Give you a chance to get used to the sound of my voice on the AT2020 before we do a comparison. And now that you've heard both microphones, can you tell the difference? Am I speaking on the WA47 Junior or the AT2020? As always, check the top corner to find out. Next up, we have the Rode M3. So we're going to compare the WA47 Junior. This is what you're hearing again back on the 8i6 with the gain at noon and no processing. Just so you can get used to that again. I'm going to switch over now to the M3. And this is me on the Rode M3. Can you tell the difference so far? Again, the uh, Rode M3 here is connected into the 8i6. I've got the gain set up at 1 o'clock on this microphone. Needs a little more gain than the 47 Junior does. Again, no processing on the mic. I have both the microphones as usual here at about 6 inches away from my mouth as I'm using as a typical working distance throughout most of this uh, review. Get into that a little bit later. But now that you've heard both, uh, let's see if you can tell the difference. And now that you've heard me on both the 47 Junior and the M3, can you tell the difference? Check the top corner to find out. And now we'll compare to the MXL 990 Blaze Edition. You're hearing me on the 47 Junior right now. Focus rate Scarlet set at noon, no processing, 48 volts phantom. Now we'll go ahead and switch over to the MXL 990. And this is the MXL 990, again, connected into the 8i6. This microphone, I have the gain set about 1130. It's a little bit more sensitive than the uh, 47 Junior is. No processing again here, 48 volts phantom power. This is what the uh, MXL 990 sounds like. And as usual, we'll see if you can tell the difference. And now that you've heard me on both microphones, can you tell the difference? Am I speaking on the 47 Junior or am I on the 990 Blaze? Check the top corner. All right, and now I've got a comparison with the AKG P170. Of course, I'm speaking on the 47 Junior right now, so that's what you're hearing me on without processing. Gain set at noon on the 8i6. Now I'm going to switch over to the P170, and this is the AKG P170 you're hearing me on. It also is connected into the Scarlet 8i6. Here I've got the gain set at 11 o'clock. This microphone's a little bit more sensitive. Again, 48 volt phantom power, no processing applied here. Can you hear the difference between the two microphones? Let's see. And now that you've heard me on both microphones, can you tell the difference? Am I on the WA47 Junior or the AKG P170? Check the top corner. And for the last comparison, I thought I'd throw a dynamic mic on here. It's a Shure SM7B, another studio staple without a question. Of course, first again, I'm speaking on the WA47 Junior. 
noon as the uh, gain on the 8i6. Uh, again, 48 volt phantom power. Now I'll switch over to the 7B. And this is me on the 7B. And of course, I've got it connected directly into the 8i6. I'm not using a mic booster here. I want to nothing to color this essentially. I want to get just the microphone through the interface. So I've got the gain here set up at about 430, a lot of gain to drive the SM7B. And uh, this is what the uh, the sound is like. And once again, now that you heard me on both the 47 Junior and the Shure SM7B, which one am I speaking on? Check that top corner again to find out. Up to this point, I've been at a working distance of about six inches, and that's really where kind of the sweet spot is without a pop filter that I like to be with this kind of microphone. You can see that if we worked up a little closer at about a three or four inch working distance, we will get some proximity effect. It will engage that a little bit. Around six inches, this is again the sound you're going to get. If you prefer to be about a foot away from the microphone, this is the tone you'll get out of it. Uh, again, this is a very sensitive microphone. It's going to pick up everything, really finds itself at home in a studio. You know, I'm using it here in a space where I've got a computer running and the fans are pretty ramped up right now. So I'm sure you can hear them in the background. So that's just a consideration. Of course, if you're using this for podcasting purposes or otherwise, you could apply some noise suppression just to get rid of that. But again, for this review, we want everything without processing. Now I'll back up to about 80, 18 inches away. And so I'm about 18 inches from the microphone. And realistically, you wouldn't want to have any further distance in this as far as for dialogue anyways. If you're trying to create some different effects, maybe you're miking up a drum kit and you want some room sound, that's a totally different story. But for this application, you know, working distance here, I'm at about 18 inches. I again really recommend here sitting right at about six inches. I think you get kind of the optimal between uh, having uh, you know good close sound to the mic, uh, really good pickup versus the ambient sound in the room and uh, not being so close to it that it's either uncomfortable to use or that you have an issue with plosives. Again, I have it kind of a cross axis a little bit because there's no external pop filter or anything on this microphone right now. We will test out plosives, we'll test out pop filters. So let's, uh, let's get into some of the actual tests here, some of the physical tests. And I'm going to start out actually here with handling noise. And so this microphone, of course, comes with a shock mount. I'm going to go ahead and tap on the uh, stand here. First of all, yeah, we'll go ahead and do that. And you can definitely hear it picking it up in the, uh, in the monitoring. That, uh, that's to be expected, again, with a sensitive mic like this. I'll tap on the body. Just listening. You know, listening if there's any resonance or anything like that. So that's, uh, that'll give you an idea. This microphone is really meant to be meant to be placed on a stand and really kept there for recordings. It's not a handheld microphone, so handling noise is less of an issue, but if you do have it on a boom arm and you move it around, it will, of course, pick up that, that sound. Now we'll get into a test a little further with plosives. I'll also do a little more with proximity, so really right up on the microphone, this is the kind of sound you're going to get. Again, I'm trying to speak across the microphone so that it's not going to, you know, fully give you plosives involved. Now I'm back to, again, about six inches away, and let's test plosives. People, people, because, because. So that'll give you an idea of the uh, plosive response with the microphone without a pop filter. Uh, of course, you know, we can go ahead and use a, uh, use a standard pop filter on this. People, people, because, because. And that, of course, cleans it up fully, so you don't have to really worry about plosives for a recording situation like that. One other type of pop filter here, I'm going to go ahead and throw one on the microphone. Sorry about the noise here. So now I have the pop filter strapped right onto here. People, people, because, because. And that'll give you an idea what you can do with that type of pop filter. Now before I get into testing out the off-axis rejection and polar patterns available on this mic, we'll just check out background rejection in the cardioid pattern. So I'm typing on a keyboard in the background, and that'll give you an idea of the sound it's picking up. Definitely picks up keyboard noise. Again, this is a condenser microphone. It's quite sensitive, really designed to pick up everything. We want to get all the clarity of whatever instrument or vocal that we're picking up. So you're going to get background noise. Again, if you want to use this for like a streaming application, a uh, little bit of, uh, of noise reduction uh, plug-in perhaps in there will take care of it for you. But uh, just so you're aware, that's the sound it picks up. Okay, and let's take a look at off-axis rejection. Again, we'll start out with the cardioid pattern here, but I'll also go through the figure of eight as well as the omnidirectional. So in the cardioid mode, right into the front of the microphone, this is the sound you get. Turning it now to about 90 degrees, this is the pickup you get from the mic. All the way around the back at 180 degrees, this is the sound that you're going to get. And the other 90 degrees, here's where we're at. And turn it back around. 
And now I'm back to facing dead on. So this is right on the front of the microphone again. I'll switch the polar pattern over, this time figure of eight. And so now figure of eight again, speaking into the front of the microphone. I'll turn it over, I'm speaking into the side of the microphone here, so at 90 degrees. Now I'm around the back at 180, and we should be hearing the same kind of pickup front and back now with the figure of eight. And finally again, around to 90 degrees the other way. This is the sound we're going to get. And so to my monitoring, I felt that it did pick up uh, properly, really, when in terms of a figure of eight. I'm going to go ahead and switch it over to Omni. And of course, we should pick up more room noise this way, but I also will uh, turn the microphone and see uh, what the pickup is like. So again, as I'm uh, speaking and just turning the microphone, give you an idea. You can listen for any sort of difference in the sound as I turn it. This is I'm uh, pretty much the back now. I uh, keep going around here, around the other side, all the way back to the front. I'll also go ahead and speak kind of above the microphone. Dropping the boom down, this is me talking above the microphone. And now I'm below the microphone and that's the sound. So to give you an idea of the overall tone, switch it back to cardioid. And now we're back on cardioid. And uh, so you heard the three patterns. There definitely is good rejection, I think. It, it really does the job of the patterns as it's supposed to. And uh, hopefully you could pick that up uh, in the audio here on YouTube. So now we'll check out the other controls on the microphone. We'll start out with the high pass filter. So I'll test it both for, uh, again, handling noise as well as sound. So we're starting out with it turned off. This is the flat frequency response of 20 to 20,000 hertz. Again, tapping on the stand here. Now I'll go ahead and switch over to the high pass. Okay, now I'm on the high pass filter again at 70 hertz. So you can see the uh, any effect you think it has on the sound of my voice. Now I'll go ahead and tap on the stand again. And it's really designed to remove kind of low rumble in the background. Can be helpful with kind of low AC noise, that type of thing. I'll switch it back to flat. Okay, and now again, I'm back on the flat here. And finally, what I'll do is I'll switch over to the 10 dB pad. So negative 10 dB. Here it is without it. Now I've switched over to negative 10 dB, so I should be at 10 dB less volume. We'll go ahead and check that out in the uh, in the recordings after, and I'll put a note here in the lower third so you can see that. And switch back over to the uh, regular no, uh, no minus 10 dB. So here we are again, cardioid pattern, no high pass filter, no pad. No processing, noon on the Scarlet 8i6. This is, again, uh, the microphone without, uh, without any adjustments. So now you get a chance to check out the physical characteristics and the dialogue audio with this microphone. I'm going to go ahead and mic up the guitar and bass cabinets behind me, and uh, we'll do some recordings. Again, we'll use frequency analysis, and we're going to compare the original recording versus that recorded through the WA-47 Junior, and we'll compare it to the Shure SM57. Of course, that's a dynamic microphone, but it is very widely used, again, for that application. So I thought it'd be useful for you to compare what it would be like to mic up a cabinet with this this microphone versus the uh, 57. <laughs> Okay, and now looking at the linear comparison of the rock recordings, we can see that both look very similar from a frequency point of view. The 57 picks up maybe a few of the higher tones, a little more emphasis. The 47 has maybe a little more emphasis on a few of the lower frequencies. Let's switch over to the log comparison and see if uh, that bears out what I'm hearing. 
And here we have the log analysis. And we can see here that the uh, WA47 Junior has a little more low emphasis than the 57 does. And that really explains what I'm hearing. I'm hearing a, a little more warmth, the 57 emphasis a little more on the top end, a little more brittle sounding. Uh, both very usable for miking up a guitar uh, amp for rock purposes, just a slightly different tone. Uh, but uh, and it does bear out here in the log analysis. This is, uh, explains what I was hearing. Now here looking at the linear comparison of the blues guitar recording through the amp, again the original recording directly into the 8i6 has additional information that the amp is not providing, thus the coloration of this particular amplifier, but comparing the 47 Junior versus the SM57, we can see a, you know, a slight indication of a little more low end here. To my ears the recordings did sound pretty similar. But uh, nonetheless, we can uh, take a look at the log analysis and see what, uh, what it shows. And so looking at the log analysis here of the blues guitar recording, we can see that additional low end, which is what we're hearing from the WA-47 Junior. The 57 sounds quite a bit brighter when you hear the two recordings, but what we're really hearing is a lot more emphasis in that low range. Uh, so we're getting a warmer tone out of this uh, condenser microphone versus the 57. And now looking at the linear comparison of the bass amp recording, again, the original recording had some additional information, but here there's a great similarity between the WA-47 Junior and the SM-57. In the recording of the 57, you could hear more of the string noise, you know, definitely heard that technique in there, um, versus the 47 gave you a little more representation of just the bass tone itself. And so depending what you're going for, I mean, you'd choose one or the other microphone to get that. Both, again, very competent for this application. Let's, uh, let's take a look at the log comparison. Okay, and now looking at the log comparison here, the recordings uh, look very, very similar. The uh, 47 has perhaps just in the very lowest frequencies a little additional emphasis, but uh, the overall tone here very, very similar between both recordings. We, of course, did have the, uh, we could hear the strings uh, a little more in the SM57 recording, and I think we have that one peak that probably shows that on the 57 side, but beyond that, this is a, you know, a very comparable recording. You could easily use either microphone again for miking up a bass amp, depending, uh, you know, if you wanted a little more of that, uh, a little more of that live sound, perhaps. And now we'll get into the processed audio demonstration. We're starting out here in the box with plugins. And as you can see, I have a soft tube saturation here, a little bit of saturation applied. That is applied before uh, Neutron 3. And again, I'm just using Neutron 3 for a platform for EQ and compression here. You can see in terms of the EQ, 
that uh, I've uh, filled out and thickened up the base a little bit, taking care of a little bit of room resonance frequencies, kind of really important with a sensitive microphone like this. Just some general tone shaping through the middle, a slight amount here to get rid of a little bit of the sibilance from this microphone. It tends to have a little bit of a, a higher frequency range that way. Uh, the compressor, you can see uh, some you know moderate compression, nothing crazy going on here, but I am using that to equal the sound out. And then I'm also using the Isotope deesser here, and uh, it'll give you an idea just to uh, clean up some of the S's. You can see it responding uh, as I'm speaking here. So that's in the box. That's with some plugins. Um, moderately tailored setup for this microphone. I didn't spend a whole lot of time getting it exact for my voice, but uh, give you an idea. Now we'll uh, check out some hardware processing. And now you're listening to me through the ART voice channel with all the processing and the channel strip applied. No in the box, so this is all hardware processing. So again, we have the WA-47 Junior connected directly into the ART voice channel. I have the gain set just a little over 10 o'clock using phantom power here, of course. Nothing as far as low cut or pad or anything going on. I've got the impedance control here actually set up at about 2K, and that's again just some modeling in terms of the tone on the microphone. I'll have another video on that coming up where we talk about using the impedance control on your preamp to uh, shape the tone of the microphone. Give it Sometimes you can give it some additional warmth or clarity depending what you're going for. I've got the uh, compression happening here and uh, kind of mild compression sitting uh, you know, at about three and a half to one. And you can see not really a whole lot being activated up here, just, just uh, to keep it kind of even. DSing going on here as well, uh, acting on frequencies in and around about eight, eight and a half K. And uh, so moderate reduction there. I also have some expansion happening just to uh, kind of tailor out some of the low end noise here. I didn't go crazy with that. I didn't want it cutting in and out completely. I could uh, crank that expansion up a little more to really fully get rid of all of the noise in the background of this room. The fans have been running on the PC for quite a while. It's pretty warm. They're really ramped up by quite a bit of noise at the moment. Um, after that, getting into the EQ, you can see I've got a little bit of boost in that low end here. Uh, sitting, you know, right in a kind of around that 150 uh, hertz range. I'm doing a little boost. Got a minor cut going on here, uh, just in kind of that uh, 350 hertz range. Again, some cuts around that 1.2, 1.3 kilohertz just to shape the mic. And very, very modest, maybe, you know, one or two dB boost in and around five kilohertz. So just again to uh, kind of shape the tone a little bit here. And uh, and that's really what I've done with the uh, with the ART voice channel fully uh, integrated hardware processing here. Now we'll uh, switch over to the DBX-286 and uh, look at it processed through, uh, through that preamp and channel strip. Okay, and now I've routed the audio through the DBX-286S. You can see I have the gain set right at about noon here to get some good s signal. Got compression going on here. I've got the drive turned up and uh, getting about a 9 dB, 6 to 9 dB reduction, uh, kind of what you'd expect here. Uh, using the deesser again uh, moderately, you can see it activating a little bit. Uh, and of course, the enhancer, bass, and treble more in the low end than the high end. The uh, DBX-286S, you know, it doesn't have as many controls. It it does a lot of things in an automated way. So like when you when you boost at some frequencies, it reduces at others, kind of like what happens with a boost and attenuate on an old-style Poltec, kind of emulating some of that going on here in the enhancer. Um, also uh, going on here is the expander gate. You can see it opening and closing just to kind of keep some of those uh, background noises out of the uh, out of the picture. And of course, I balance the gain off here so that I'm getting uh, equal gain in and out of the uh, in and out of the channel strip. And so this is the sound through the DBX-286S, a different type of preamp and channel strip. Again, all hardware processing here. No plugins in the box. Anything going on that way? Sound from the WA-47JR, and we'll go ahead and switch back over to unprocessed audio. And now that you had a chance to hear the microphone with plug-in and hardware processing, I've got it back here without any processing. Again, direct into the Scarlett 8i6, set at noon. Uh, nothing really applied. This is direct out of the microphone. So back to the back to the unprocessed sound. And I'll give you my final thoughts. So this microphone, of course, high expectations for how it's going to perform. And I think it did perform very well. Uh, I have to say that I, uh, to my monitoring, I found the clarity to be excellent on this microphone. I found the pickup across all frequency ranges also to be very, very good. Absolutely usable for miking up amp cabinets, can be used for dialogue. And again, this microphone has quite a reputation and following in studios. It gets a lot of use. It's a workhorse microphone. In this price range, I'll tell you that 
there's quite a few uh, quite a few studio engineers that I've I've spoken with over the years that that tell me that this is just crazy for the price on this mic and so it's easy to keep a few around the studio for uh, for a lot of general use cases so um, definitely definitely saw it there hopefully the process demonstration gave you an idea of what you could tailor the sound to if you want to use this for more of a dialogue situation uh, whether it be podcasting or streaming or otherwise really this microphone and the price point you know we're we're not really anywhere above uh, the cost of an sm7b or an re20 or anything so you certainly could consider something like this for uh, for use in podcasting and it would give you some added flexibility, in my opinion, for uh, miking up instruments. So if you, uh, in, you know, into either recording music or doing music production, this is a great general all-around microphone to have in your mic locker. Uh, it'll get uh, it'll get a lot done for you. And uh, you know, being condenser, of course, it's going to work with pretty much all your interfaces. You're not going to have any issue with a preamp driving this. Hopefully, also the preamp comparisons gave you an idea of you know the difference in tone you're going to get when you're dealing with uh, you know different tube situations. Uh, DBX preamp as well, really popular. So uh, give you an idea of, uh, again, the tone that you get with that. And so overall, would I recommend this microphone? Absolutely. In this price point, you're going to be hard pressed to find anything that has this level of performance, whether it's the natural sound, the clarity, the low noise floor, solid build construction. There's really not a whole lot you can say about this microphone that isn't a reason to purchase it. So, I mean, and it, you know, obviously it's, you know, this is not a hundred dollar microphone. This is, uh, you know, this is uh, four times the, the price of that, but uh, you get a lot of value here. And, uh, you know, the reality is that in my experience, you have to spend a whole lot more than what this microphone costs to get a really appreciable difference in sound. Like you got to get into at least a thousand, fifteen hundred dollars before you really start to see a whole lot of benefits. So for me, this is one of the best values on the market. And of course, if you're into microphones and audio gear, you wanna level up your recordings, production, podcasts, or streaming, check out one of the other videos on the screen. As always, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.